Hey everyone, it is Michael Zapersky here, and today I'm really excited to have Eric J. Johnson. Eric, welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here, Michael. Yeah, so Eric, you are a professor at Columbia Business School, uh, where you're the director of the Center for Decision Sciences. Your research examines the kind of interface and connection between behavioral design research, economics, uh, decisions made by consumers, managers, and the, really the implications for public policy, markets, and marketing. Uh, and your latest book, which is called The Elements of Choice, Why the Way We Decide uh, Matters, is, is a really a fascinating read. I'm, I'm excited to dive into it. Uh, I really want to get into how consultants can make better decisions to improve their results in their business, improve the results in their lives, uh, and also how they can use this to, to provide greater value and even more impact uh, for their clients. But before we do that, I'd love to go back in time a little bit, which, uh, which is how did you get interested in this whole world of decision making and decision sciences? Yeah, I've been very lucky throughout my career. I managed to stumble into working with some great people, uh, several of whom have won Nobel Prizes along the way. Not that I knew it when I sort of talked my way into working with them, but it, it's worked out well. I grew up in a working class town in New Jersey. And when people were making choices, it was in you know, college prep school, high school I was going to, they were making very different choices, even though they were both you know, equally bright. So some went to the community college, others were applying to Ivy League schools. So I wondered what was it that made them make those very different kinds of choices. Um, and then I eventually ended up going to graduate school for psychology and happened to work with uh, uh, someone named Herb Simon, who actually was the first psychologist to win a Nobel Prize. And he was very much about how the mind uh, and how people actually made decisions, as opposed to how economists think we make them. He was much more of a realist, let's say that. Do you remember going back in time? I know it's just you know a couple of years ago or so, where where you were starting to think about, and I'm joking with a couple of years, I'm talking Thank about you. you know, if, if, if anyone's one, watching, they see that, but that's okay. <laughs> you, you, you've had experience for sure, but no, back, like you mentioned that you you saw people making different decisions, different choices, and you, you start wondering about that, and then you start to study that more. Do you remember that, that that moment, or maybe it was one summer, but the experience in the environment where you really start to become interested in this? Because many people, you know, become interested in let's say marketing or economics or whatever it might be, but it often stems from an experience that they've had, whether good or bad. Can you identify or have you, you know, was there any kind of uh, experience that you had that led you to really becoming interested more in how people make decisions? It's interesting. I think when I was an undergraduate, I started working as a research assistant and the fact that I was working for us or thought I had some potential maybe. So they started giving me some books. One of them was Herb Simon's Sciences of the Artificial. And other things like that, that really mm -hmm. just sort of opened up my eyes. The other thing that was really remarkable that got me much more interested in applying this knowledge is seeing firsthand how people were making medical choices, both in family and then years later, as I talk about a little bit, um, I myself am, am a cancer survivor. And wow. trying to figure out some very basic things, both in my own behavior, but also it's what got me interested in one of the most well-known streams of research I've done, which is about organ donation. Why do people decide to be a donor either at their death or even more interestingly, while they're living? Right. Um, and that just struck me as, wow, what an incredibly difficult and important decision that is. When I was reading your book, the first, even in the first few pages, I had like this light bulb moment that just, it, it, it all just seemed to make so much sense. Like, wow, it is so true. We all make decisions. We make multiple decisions in any given day. Yet very often we pay little attention to the decisions that, that we're making. Sometimes it almost seems like it's a, a subconscious choice. Could you offer maybe just a, a couple of examples uh, of decisions that people make uh, that might be everyday decisions or kind of basic decisions, but uh, how, how these could be important? Because some people might be listening, well, what does this all have to do with the world of, of consulting? So just to kind of put this into a bit, of, a bit more context, what are a few examples of those kind of basic yet maybe critical decisions that we all make? Yeah, and let me add one other critical point, which is as we make decisions, we don't think much about the person who's presenting those decisions to us. Mm. What gets called choice architecture or the choice architect. I call it designer. For your listeners, you might call it consultants, which are people who are deciding how to pose options to you, how to describe the options. And we don't think about that. So making decisions is often automatic, 
But also what we don't pay attention to is how that was presented. Um, a story, um, I was lucky enough to be at a foundation and talking to the foundation president about this. He had a three-year-old daughter. He said, oh, I know what you're talking about. I used to have a terrible fight every evening when I said, do you want to go to bed to my daughter? And then I changed the, the way the decision was posed to being, do you want to fly into bed or do you want to bounce into bed? No more fights. Yeah. And so even in everyday life, you, that's not exactly an expensive consulting uh, um, engagement. It is an important decision. We sure. are choice architects or what I call designers. And so, you know, the daughter sitting there was saying, oh, I have a choice here. She's not thinking, ah, daddy's tricking me. Right. So I yeah, think I mean, it's, it, that's a good example. It's an even, even common example. I mean, well, it resonates with me. I, I have two young daughters. Um, so that example, as I read it, really did resonate, uh, made me kind of laugh and smile. And I think what is so true is that, uh, and for me, as I went through your book, it became very apparent. Every We have an opportunity to kind of mold or architect or to design how we present information in, in every aspect of, of our lives. And, and very often, we're just not even paying attention to that. But yet, how we, how we pose that or how we display or communicate and present that information can lead to very different types of, of results. You kind of talk about like the influences that we all have in our life that, that make some choices more appealing than, than others. Could you talk a little bit about what those influences are uh, that, that can make one choice seem very appealing and make another one seem you know, not appealing at all? So there are two basic things I, I think about when I'm talking to somebody about their decision-making process and what the decision is like. The first is, is what I call a plausible path. How do they decide how to decide? Look, in most decisions, we're gonna look at a small subset of information. And so to make a good decision, we have to look at the best information, but we don't always do that. So what is the path we take through the information? Paths can be clicking through a website to look at the right information. It could, the analogy that struck me was basically walking. When we start making, when we start a walk, we choose how we're going and we don't revisit it. Um, today, I was driving down um, to New York and you know I hit the GPS and it said, you should go this way. And I was locked in that path. And that's how we often make decisions. We decide how we're going to decide what information we're going to look at early on, and we don't revisit that. So that's one thing. The other thing is the fact that much of our what we think about as our preferences are things we're assembling on the spot. They're actually thinking about instances from memory we're recalling things. So, you know, I'm, I'm going to um, think about a decision like, where I'm going to go to school or what kind of meal I'm going to have. I'm instantly thinking about other experiences I've had with schools like this or with people who have told me about schools like this. It's that process of retrieving things from memory, what I call assembled preferences. That's so very important. Mm. When we think about the, the business owner, how do you feel like we'll, we'll take the independent consultant or the small consulting firm owner right now, where have you seen, because I know that you, you also have done consulting for, for many organizations over the years, how have you seen this, this concept of decision-making and decision architecture kind of play into the role or into the, the business for a consultant? So a consultant, of course, is on their forehead should be written designer, because what they're doing is designing. They're both designing it for the client, which mm. is very important. We can talk about that a little bit more. Yeah. And they're also recommending designs often for the client to use with customers. So, for example, one thing you know we, I talk about, which is I think really relevant here, is how many options you present somebody. Um, you know, one possibility is you could say, I'm going to present you every option there is that's available. And one of my favorite examples, I was ended up talking to people in, in New York City, high school choice. Now, kids in New York get to choose high schools with their parents' help. And how many high schools should you present somebody? Well, it turns out the city of New York presents 769 high schools. Wow. In a book the size of an old school telephone directory. And of course, what happens is that a telephone directory ends up sitting in the bottom of the locker. And right. you know, kids talk about it, but that information doesn't get used. Now, by analogy, if you're a consultant, you're sort of talking about courses of action you have a very powerful tool, which is how many courses of action do you present to the client? Mm -hmm. You probably don't want to present 769 or even 69 or even you know a small subset. And you want to think about those carefully because they're going to be 
in most cases, the client's going to pick from the set you present. Yeah. How do you think about that? I mean, let, let's take the example of, and this has actually happened with, with a client who, uh, you know, used to pro, uh, kind of present, or I'd say first develop a, a very uh, in-depth report. And it was, you know, hundred plus pages long. And this would, this would be kind of the, um, the, the output that they would give to the client, the deliverable. Uh, and the client would, as you just said, they would look at this and, and very often not take action on it because there's just so much information in it, in it. The, what they shifted to and we helped them to kind of develop was something that, that, you know, was maybe 25 pages long. And so a lot less information, but a lot more very specific recommendations. When you think about this yourself in terms of distilling or taking a lot of information and uh, boiling it down into less information that can create uh, a better outcome or a better kind of, you know, result, how, how would you recommend that people think about that when they have a lot of options, a lot of you know, experience, expertise, a lot of things that they could recommend. What's just the thought process that you would go through to try and, you know, arrive at something more optimal? It's interesting because I think that's true of every designer. They have to make a decision of what to present. And I think, you know, you'll hear some people say, well, more choice is always worse. Mm. And it's true that as you add more options, sort of like you're suggesting, Michael, it gets overwhelming. At the right. same time, you're adding variety. So you don't want to present a, a client with just one option. And particularly if you don't know everything about their business, what they should be doing, you want them to bring their knowledge. The analogy to a high school kid, you don't want to give the high school kid one choice because they know what they're looking at and often you don't. Right. So you're going to want to give them. So there's a balancing act there between having enough choices so you can explore the possible spaces and give them a chance to actually think about different options. At the same time, not overwhelming them. So there's an increasing force, which is you want to give them more options, and a decreasing force, which is you want to limit the number of options because you don't want to overwhelm them. So you're going to end up, depending on the situation, coming up with a number that's perfect for that particular decision. It's there's not, I can't say it would be a terrible consulting business if I said five. No right. one would want to hire me. They would just read the book and be done. I would love to hear your perspective on, I mean, the, the kind of the accepted best practice in the world of consulting for, for a full engagement with a client, when you're talking about options and pricing is, is to provide three, three options. You have kind of good, better, best. You have the low kind of entry point. You have the, the ideal kind of the, the best value that most people will go for in the middle. And then you have your higher priced option. And so just to make it very simple, you might have something that is uh, $25,000 at the low end, then maybe 45,000, then maybe 85,000. So the gap between option two and option three is significantly greater than the gap between option one and option two. What just... When you hear that, when you kind of think about that, that layout of pricing, where does your mind go? Does that, does that make sense? Is something big missing there? How do you kind of interpret that? Well, that's a good example of how people who are designers might be making decisions that are, or spreading options that are in a way that's sort, sort of haphazard. We know mm -hmm. something really basic from that, from, from research, and that is people tend to get the middle option. Right. That in fact is called the compromise effect. But think about it, you still aren't done when you say the middle because you have to decide how far up should the high option be? How low should be the low option be? There's still a lot of design to be done. And mm. should the middle option be, let's to use your example, it should be between 25 and let's say 60,000 halfway between, or can I actually say maybe it should be an 80,000 and 30,000 and put something in between there. You are a designer when you're making those choices and you need to think hard about how that goes on. Now, three is actually good now, but you could always add a fourth, which may actually make the third option more appealing. So that right. design is actually a lot more complicated than always a rule of three. Do, do you kind of go through in your mind or do you have a, a framework for the steps that you go through when you're making these, these decisions? Like what, what would you recommend to somebody or how would you guide somebody if they were to kind of go through the process of creating uh, you know, making better decisions and designing the, a better kind of path to, to, to decision-making, are there certain steps that people should go through and, and kind of are our best practice? Well, I think the thing, the principle I, I would say is, and, and I think your 100 plus page report's a good example of not doing this, right. which is you want to make it fluent. You want to make it easy at the beginning for people mm -hmm. to make choices. And once they're engaged, then they don't change. And you want it to be easy in a way that gets them to look at the right information. Mm. Um, and so let me give you a concrete example. Um, 
which is that in many cases, when we design places where people make choices, when we're designers, we tend to give them too much information in general, not just about options. And we don't tend to make it easy for them to process. So I'm sitting here. Um, if I had looked out my window in 2011, I would have seen a U.S. Air Flight 1549 coming down the Hudson, which landed. Now, as you might remember, that was famously uh, Chessy Sullenberger, or Sully as we was known, landing his flight. Now, he was a hero. He, the whole crew were heroes. But the thing that made it really important is there was a gauge. And it was so important, he turned this gauge on as soon as they hit the geese. He had 288 seconds to act between that moment and when he landed. And he had to choose between, it turns out, three options. Trying to go back to LaGuardia, trying to go over to a small uh, airport called Teterboro, or maybe landing somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And this gauge basically let him do the thinking very quickly. It basically did some math for him and said, if you fly at this angle, you'll go as far as possible. Mm. And that gave him the ability to actually to, he used the phrase load shed, which is basically to think, to actually not think about unimportant things and think about the important things. He actually talked, the, the, the analogy, just to finish the point, is that he actually talked about it's like utilities. When you have a generator, um, a power plant that's not doing well, they cut the power to the factories and not to the hospitals. Right. And when you're in a stressful situation, you want to basically think about the important stuff, the hospitals, and not worry as much about the factories. So it's that effort that's the important thing. It also sounds like that that gauge, having a way to, to, to measure or almost kind of create a bit of a, a benchmark is, is critical to this whole process. Uh, what other examples are there of, of gauges maybe in the world of of professional services, accounting? I know you've done work in, in loans and, and other types of uh, finance uh, you know, the financial world. Could, could you maybe share a couple more examples of gauges that you've seen that people use in, in this process? Let me give you one which I find interesting, and that is interest rates. Mm. Um, you know, it's the essential part of either borrowing or lending money um, or investing. And one of the things I take all my Columbia MBAs through is I give them a task and say, you can't use your calculator, I want to use your head. And I say, imagine you had a $10,000 gift that you could invest for a 10% real interest until you, from now until you retire. And let's say they're 25 and they're retiring at, at 65. How much would that be worth? Now, we think interest rates are actually an important, and they are important, obviously, uh, yardstick or gauge, as you said, right. in, in how, how much it costs to borrow or what, it, what are the benefits of savings. And when I ask them this, they end up usually saying about $200,000. The real number is $750,000 or close to that. Now, interest rates aren't a very good gauge when you have compounding. Right. And so that's one example. And so when I've done work, for example, I did some work at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. We thought a lot about what the right gauge to give consumers are, both to encourage savings and to, to actually make them more responsible borrowers. And, you know, frankly, interest rates aren't the only thing you want to present somebody. You probably want to present them the total cost of borrowing or the total return they could expect, you know, when they retire or whenever they meet their savings goal. Right. When you look at your, whether it's your MBA students or, or clients that you've worked with around the world or different research projects that you've been part of, what are, you know, one or two of the most common mistakes that you see people making when it comes to this kind of the decision-making process? Well, the first thing is they don't realize they're choice architects. They don't realize they're designers. So they're just doing things the way they've always been done. And that gives a lot of, that's a big mistake because essentially you have a very powerful tool. You almost think of it as a, a superpower that you don't know you have. So you can actually do an awful lot to actually influence that choice that you're unaware of. And the important thing is just because you're unaware of it doesn't mean it doesn't have an effect. Mm. Okay, so that's sort of the number two thing is, is you're not doing okay. Every choice has its own architecture, its own design. So one of the very powerful tools, I talk about many of them, is the default. What happens if somebody doesn't make a decision? Mm, yes. And people just sort of take that as a given. 
Uh, let's go back to savings for just a second. One of the ways to get people to save money is just to save, change the default. For years in the United States, until about 1996, the default in savings was always zero. And that was the most common amount people would save. And it's not the amount they wanted to save. It just was the thing. They didn't like making the decision, so that's what happened. Now, um, Department of Labor allowed companies to change that default to 3%. Well, most companies went to 3%. You could send it to larger uh, figures. And guess what became the most com common amount saved? 3%. Now, that's not because 3% is the right amount. It's because that's what companies thought people would be willing to do. Now, it turns out they probably should be saving more than that. And right. as a result, setting the wrong default is actually hurting their employees, mm. not helping them as much as they could. Yeah. Uh, that's such a powerful idea when I think about how that could be kind of transitioned or, or positioned for an interaction with, with your clients. Uh, and how by kind of setting a gauge or or setting even kind of a conservative limit as you're making a recommendation, it's it's almost like you're you're providing a bit of a guardrail that it's you know if you're if you're telling them that it should be you know between ten and thirty, then they're probably even if even if they're going to be conservative, they'll probably be at ten. Maybe they won't be at the thirty where you want them to be, but they'll still be kind of like within a range as opposed to not even putting that kind of guardrail in there. So I think that's a a really powerful idea for for those who have teams. If, if we want our, our teams, every member of our team to be able to make better decisions, how, how would you recommend that, that a founder or a CEO, a, a leader could, could support their team members to be able to make better decisions? I think actually, so A, the team leader is, is a designer. So they can be presenting options. So you know, when I have people working for me, I'm very, I try to be very aware of the choices I'm giving them. You know, do you want assignment A, B, or C, and maybe not mention assignment D where they wouldn't fit? Right. So A, leaders are choice architects. They do design. Um, and everything else I, I, I believe you can do. Um, for example, how you describe the options. Take that, for example. I could be talking about assignments in terms of the upside, the downside, the potential length, the amount of travel that's involved. I, I, if we start traveling again. Um, but all those things are things that I, as a leader, control. Mm. And they're going to have an influence um, on, on the, the choices that, that my employees, my team members are going to make. Right. So that's you know the first thing, basically presenting choices in a way that they're going to make the choice that's right for them and you, because I think that's a great case. They make the choice that's best for them and for you. You're usually both better off. Right. And, and for those that, that want to start to uh, analyze or, or dissect uh, the choices that, that they are being presented with, right? If we, if we take this from the, the kind of the opposite perspective that people are marketing to us, right? They want us mm -hmm. to, to take action on something. They want us to, you know, to move toward the direction that is uh, beneficial for them. If we want to try and be, become better at analyzing that to really uh, understand and, and make sure that the choice that we're making is the right choice for us and not just for, for them, how should we approach that? Are there certain things that you tend to look for? Like when you are being presented with an offer, whether it's for insurance or, or travel or whatever it might be, how, how does your mind go to start kind of breaking that down to think about the different perspectives or the different you know, options that are uh, kind of being presented within, the, within that choice? So the first thing I, I want to probably make some of your listeners feel better because they may be thinking, I never do that. Right. And the simple fact of the matter is most of us don't. We're too busy making choices, making mm. a decision. It's like the GPS analogy. I'm too busy driving to actually be tap tapping on the GPS to see is there a better route there. Right. Um, so the other thing that's actually quite surprising, if you ask people about whether the design influenced their choice, and we know this mostly from default. So if I pick a, I, it, let's let's make it con concrete. I say we're going to have um, chicken for dinner tonight, unless you want something else. And you ask people, did that default influence your choice? They say no. So it's very hard to see past the choice architecture to right. see that. Now, hopefully, after hearing us today and perhaps after reading the book, you know what the tools are. You can actually be aware. So you can say, gee, why am I only be presented three options? Right. Or why those three options? Or to use another example, why is why are you using interest rates instead of dollars? You know, that basically, once you know the vocabulary of 
of the designer. You can help understand what they're doing a little bit, but it's not easy. It's actually very hard. You've been studying this, this area, Eric, for, for many years. I mean, you, you've written a, a really great book on it. As you said, go, provides tools and a lot of uh, very detailed and in-depth information. How has this knowledge that you've accumulated and this kind of perspective and experience that you've accumulated over the years, how has that impacted your own personal life? Because I can only imagine that yeah, as you are being presented with all kinds of information, your mind is even maybe subconsciously kind of analyzing it and, and viewing it in a very different way than it likely did before you started down this path of research and, and all that. Is there anything that you look at today that you, know, like you, could, you, know, you can't believe how you didn't used to look at it like that in, in the past? I just, I'm very interested to know like your personal journey around this and how, how you kind of observe and, and, and analyze all the choices and, and options of, of life around you. So um, one of the things that I've learned, and actually someone asked me a similar question, and I realized I had done this without knowing it, is I always, when I set up a meeting, I set a default time. I'm flexible, but how is, and then presented for time, you know, 1030 on Thursday. And more times rather than not, that default gets selected. Right. Now, that's the, great, because now I can schedule my meetings, you know, back to back or with 15 minute breaks, whatever I want to do. I'm not co coercing anybody. I'm actually saying I'm flexible and I will, I will be respons responsive. But that's a, ca a case where I can actually become much more efficient simply by having a, a, a default. And there's lots of those. And I won't go into, my wife is in the same uh, profession and she has read the book. So you can imagine some of our conversations about where we're going to dinner or what movie or play we're going to see. Right. Um, and and it's, it's, it gets to be a little bit like um, uh, the Princess Bride that I know that you know that I know, and, and we know each other's uh, tricks. In fact, I once was teaching a bunch of MBAs that she had taught negotiation, and they're trying to get a delay on the exam. And mm -hmm. I, I said, oh, that's interesting. You're trying to negotiate the exam with me. And who do you think taught you negotiation? Right. <laughs> um, I, I want to ask you about, about your book and just a couple more questions before wrapping up. Uh, I mean, your, your book, it's for those who are, who are seeing this on video, it, it's a, it's a thick, good read. I mean, it, it is packed, uh, with, with really deep and valuable information. Uh, it's also different than a, than a typical book on behavioral economics or, or things of that nature in that it, it's, it's not a dry read. It's very enjoyable. There's a lot of great stories and illustrations. What went into writing this book? I mean, how did you think about writing it? How did you think about structuring it? Any best practices, any things that you, you, know, you feel really made the book what it, what it became to be for those who might be thinking about writing their first book or their second or third book? You know, I'd written academic books before and there you just sit down and type what you're thinking. Um, you might think about structuring things different ways, but this was very different because I worked really hard and it was fun. To, to explore examples. Yeah. So, you know, how often does an academic get to read uh, uh, reports about how the U.S. Air 1549 crashed and what Sully looked at and read transcripts of his testimony? How often do you actually get to read about and interview people who've designed the New York City school choice system? Right. So part of it is it's important to get examples that make the point and not just because they're examples of points you want to make, but they also make you think about what you want to say. And so, you know, everything for in there, there are examples about dating services. And I already mentioned, I'm very happily married. So that was reading about dating services. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, you know, re um, reading things I wouldn't normally read and trying to find places where things came to life, both where things worked out well, or in other cases where things worked out terribly. From start to finish with the book, what percentage of your time would you say that you spent on research and kind of collecting these stories and information and what percentage of the time was actually spent kind of, you know, writing and editing the book? You know, the, it's hard to separate out because staring at a blank screen um, and trying to come up with another example just merges into the process of writing right. um, and rewriting and rewriting. I have a great editor who helped a lot. Um, and I, I thought I, I used to think I was a good writer. <laughs> and now I think I'm a much better writer. Right. But, you know, th that, that process, um, you know, takes much longer than anyone thinks about it if you're going to do a good job. And, you know, there are lots of examples that ended up on the cutting room floor because they just didn't make the point right. 
Right. So, I mean, you're, you're an author, you're a professor, uh, you've been consulting as well. In, in all of this, is there one or two things that you feel in your day-to-day life really give you uh, more mental clarity or focus, just allow you to perform at, at a higher level? Any habits or anything that you do quite consistently uh, that you just feel has a big impact on, on your success? I think, particularly in consulting, trying to understand where the client is coming from. You know, I, you often you go in and say, oh, I know that. I know this. I'm just going to use that solution. But often there's this something more subtle going on. Mm. And I think understanding that, trying to put yourself, you know, into understanding the, the pressures that the client is feeling, and many of which they can't talk about because they don't see them. You know, right. we're not the only choice architects. Their situation's a choice architect. They have a boss. They have, um, you know, employees. Though these people are also influencing their choice and having an ability to step out out of sort of your own view of the situation. I was doing some work with, um, uh, let me just say, a, a well-known um, company um, which uh, the, involved a Nobel laureate, and these were all folks that were like myself, working class kids from New Jersey, um, you know, and, and so understanding a little bit about that background, yeah. that they all were achieving more than they ever thought they would. And they were really happy, but not maybe incredibly secure, um, mm. you know, was very helpful. So I think that, I think that empathy, I hate to use that word, but helps. Why do you hate to use that word? Well, I think it's, it's I, 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 I'm a cognitive psychologist. I don't talk about the touchy feely stuff. <laughs> um, and right. that's not my expertise. What, what, and what would you uh, suggest to, to those who say, you know, Eric, that's, that's great advice. I also would like to learn more and be able to empathize, you know, better with, with my ideal clients and, and those that I'm, I'm looking to serve or am serving. What suggestions would you offer to them? How, how can they get better at that? It's a great question. As I said, this isn't my expertise. Um, although I think just doing it, taking the perspective of what the client client is thinking what they fear might be happening. Mm. Um, just understanding what attributes are important to them. Um, you know, a good choice architect does two things. One is they know where the chooser is what I call those people. The chooser is coming from, but also have a good idea of what they should be doing mm. and combining those two. So for example, if an attribute is more important for their choice, make the attribute easy to process and, and first in the list, um, you know, it'd be very useful. There are lots of examples that I've thought about, but let's say you care about the environment. You can present that information in lots of different ways. Um, you, just to give you one example, the US government gives it to people in terms of miles per gallon, which turns out to be misleading. A car that gets 25 miles per gallon is not half as efficient as a car that gets 50 miles per gallon. It's actually a much greater proportion. So something like two thirds is efficient. Now, if you just change that description into gallons per mile or gallons per thousand miles, it's now in a way that people, we're not used to it, but it actually is linear. You should pay more for the car, twice as much for the car that saves you the additional gas. It makes it much easier. So I think getting out of the engineering head and into the customer's head, in this case, the client's head, is very useful. One other metric example, I can describe calories and maybe many people out there understand calories. Um, but when I'm deciding whether to have a, um, a nice dessert or not, you know, I'm not thinking of the calories. But if I, you tell me, you know, that's the equivalent of walking 2.3 miles. That's like to have much more impact. And so it's actually translating the attributes of an option into metrics that you can understand, yeah. you know, dollars in terms of, instead of interest rates, miles walking instead of calories. Um, those are all good examples of trying to get into the way the client, the chooser wants to think about the problem. Yeah, those are great examples. Thanks for, for sharing them. Uh, I'm sure that, that you are uh, someone who, who spends time reading books and, and you know, collecting more information. I'd love to know in the last six months or so, what is one book, uh, could be fiction or nonfiction, that you have read or listened to that, that you've really enjoyed?
you know, one of the funny things about do, writing and doing these PR tours, you do a lot less reading than, than you would like. Um, and in the last six months, you know, a lot of what I've been reading are, are other books sort of in the same space. Mm. Um, one good one is uh, f- that is more on the personal front than on a consulting front is How to Change by Katie Milkman. Okay. Uh, that, that is actually quite a good book. Another one, actually, which is very much um, relevant, I think, is by um, Phil Tetlock, and um, I'm forgetting the name of the first author, Gardner, the first name of their author, called Super Forecasting. Super Forecasting. Yeah, it's actually quite a good book about how you would make yourself a better forecaster using many of the tools Mm. that have come out of cognitive psychology and decision research. It's been, it's about... I think it was published in 2013 and it's, but it's quite a good read. That, fantastic. We're going to link all that up in the show notes. Um, finally, I'd love for people to learn where they should go to learn more uh, about your book, Eric, and, and more about you and, and your work. Can you maybe guide us on, on the one place people can go to learn more uh, about your new book here, the elements of choice and, uh, and everything else you have going on? Since I know something about marketing, guess what? There's a website called theelementsofchoice.com. There you go. Would be a, a good place. And then, you know, all the academic work you can find at Columbia, but everything about the book and things I'm doing um, will, will be at elementsofchoice.com. Sounds good. We're going to have all that as well linked up in the show notes. Eric, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, really enjoyed the conversation and, and really enjoyed your book. Michael, thank you so much for saying that. And th- thank you for having me. And thanks to all your listeners.